you have here unionist memory that is forgotten mm -hmm. and people are like oh we don't want anything to do with unionists and unionism is not a good thing to kind of have and then you get the new other aspect that you kind of have really nicely in the book that today a lot of people while not talking about unionist memory are talking about african-american serving in the confederacy and yeah. without the same pension records as kind of evidence to say oh there is black confederates yeah and, and this is very much arguing against that yeah and this is i mean this is building off people like kevin levine whose book uh you know searching for what was it searching for black confederates came out um last year and which he he sort of took apart the myth and I sort of am building off that because I think there's more to it than just taking apart the myth. The myth is the starting point, and he does an excellent job mm -hmm. of it. Um, I think when we start looking at that myth, this myth that we look at these pension records. So this, this set of pensions, they're called Class B pensions in North Carolina. They're called different things in different states. Are They're in five southern states, have pensions for African Americans who portray themselves as loyal slaves. And so if you go forward in 1927 and say, I was a loyal slave, here's who my master was, I went to war with him and served him loyally, you can get a very small pension. Now, I need to be clear here because people have tried to say these are Confederate pensions. They are not Confederate pensions. They are loyal slave pensions. Yeah. Um, in fact, they are explicitly, if you look at the documents around them, the laws creating them, the letters around the issuing of them, the rules about how much money you them, they are reifying a racial hierarchy. African Americans would receive less money than a Confederate veteran would. They don't receive the pensions as early. It's, it's another uh, 20 or 30 years before they're able to get these pensions after white Confederate veterans are allowed to start getting money, right? After they're, after Confederate veterans start getting their money, it's, it's another uh, 20 years. Their widows aren't eligible, okay. unlike okay. Confederate veterans whose widows are eligible. And the money is just minuscule comparatively and even in the language and the requirements, it's very clear that what they're rewarding is two things. One is presenting yourself as loyal during the war, but also remaining obedient after the war. It's actually in the rules in South Carolina that they can take away your loyal slave pension if you don't, if, if you aren't well behaved, which is not something that you have for Confederate pensions, right? So it's, in other words, you're going to be upheld as an example of how African Americans should act, getting less money, deserving less money presenting themselves as they're always have, they have to have white witnesses to testify mm -hmm. for them, right? So you're reifying white supremacy there, right? So every element of these sort of pensions are allowing you to create this myth that there's lots of loyal slaves. And some of these guys actually go to uh, reunions as loyal slaves and they present themselves as loyal slaves. They are not, they're very explicitly always second class. Um, and they are always saying things like, uh, you know, sort of they have to push this party line that, you know, they respect the veterans. They're being used to celebrate Confederate veterans at the time. And Confederate veterans are very clear that if these pensions were equal, they object to them. In fact, in South Carolina, there's a scandal where um, this cook supposedly gets a pension and people freak out. And they're basically like, it's fine for him to get a pension, but it can't be as much money and it can't be called a veteran's pension. Like they're very explicit. Years later, we look back at these pensions and we people start pretending that these are are Confederate soldiers who volunteered in some cases. Well, the first problem is there's very few of them. So even if it were true, it wouldn't matter. Um, it wouldn't really change much of our story. I mean, we're talking, you know, a couple thousand across the entire South, uh, a couple hundred in North Carolina, and none of them claim to be soldiers. If they claim to be soldiers, they're always rejected. That's the funny thing. The ones that actually do claim to be soldiers are rejected um, out of hand. But this myth allows us to pretend the lost cause has nothing to do with slavery. And so it plays into other evolving myths, mm -hmm. right, going on. If we have, what I find really interesting is not only are these guys not actually soldiers, mm -hmm. but in some cases, much like Confederate pensions, they weren't even doing what they claimed they did during the war. Every one of them, I mean, a lot of them claim that there's there's certain tropes that they grasp and they very quickly realize if I use this trope, I'm more likely to get it. So a lot of them claim things like, I helped bring my owner's body home or my injured owner home uh, from war is a common sort of trope you see in these tales and in the pensions both. There's both the stories and the, the pensions. You see this sort of trope and they, they're playing a role. And in some cases, um, for instance, the last class B pensioner, 
uh, in North Carolina, um, he was five years old when the war ended. Uh, and so either he went to war with his master as a five-year-old or he was lying. And, and I suspect um, what he was doing is he realized if I play this role, I can gain social capital, which will protect my family in the era of Jim Crow and help give them job opportunities potentially and give me job opportunities by playing this role. Mm-hmm. I'll also get a small amount of money. His brother does the same thing. And by doing that, his brother actually becomes um, sort of a very popular newspaper salesman um, who sells newspapers at the, on the street. And he's able to sell a lot of newspapers by sort of playing mm-hmm. a character. And I think this is another case where at the time, I think a lot of people knew these were lies, um, mm-hmm. but nobody cared because the lies were convenient. Uh, people knew that these guys who were saying, oh, I was a super loyal slave and they dressed very funny. There's certain aspects of how they dress. And mm-hmm. um, people knew they were stretching the truth at the very least. Right. That they were exaggerating. Uh, perhaps they thought they really had gone to war, but they were exaggerating. But it, it served a purpose. It was a convenient mm-hmm. purpose and it reified white supremacy. And it said, look, African-Americans can be happy in a subservient position. Um, and so um, these lies evolve. And that's why these lies matter. Um, and so, um, I think it's a, a really important, um, you know, and there's been some discussion about whether we should really be talking about black Confederates. And, and I think for me, yeah, historians know they're not a thing, right? Like we know that there weren't thousands of black Confederate soldiers. Like you don't have to convince any, any legitimate historian, but the memory, there's two aspects of that. First off is people believe it. So it does matter. And historians have an an obligation as guardians of the past, if we really are going to be consider ourselves that um, to speak out. But the other aspect is the creation of that lie is as important as the reality of the war, Mm -hmm. because the creation of that lie is what's influencing society today. And so to me, um, I think the question is not, do we debunk this lie, but how do we understand this lie's purpose? Mm-hmm. What is it doing? What is its purpose and how is it shaping society today? And what do we do about it? Mm-hmm. Is a far more fundamental question and a far more important question than debunking any one example story. And so debunking again, I think is, is, is the starting point um, mm-hmm. in all of this. It's not enough to debunk, it's also to understand its purpose. And again, I think it comes back to justifying white supremacy uh, yeah. in new ways. It's a new form of white supremacy which denies it's a white supremacist. Right? It, it's a form of racism that denies it's racist, um, which is um, which allows you to say Confederate veterans aren't just for whites, even while um, they really are. Um, if you can pretend that there's these these token African Americans who are also being celebrated, then you're not being racist by only celebrating white men, because inherently celebrating Confederate veterans is celebrating white men. You, you're inherently celebrating a selective group of society, a group that is only white. Mm-hmm. Um, and so by doing that, you are having an exclusionary history. And I think that the sort of final bit of the book, the last chapter and the last, and the epilogue are really focused on the sort of the implications mm-hmm. of what happens when we have these exclusionary histories, these history that ignore the contributions of African Americans or that distort them. Um, where does that put us as a society? And I think it's a really important thing to think about because these narratives, um, do shape our current politics.